Well, we've been in a series, Cinematic Christmas. We've looked at uh, several Christmas movies. What we did is we let each of the pastors choose their favorite and work with that and see what kind of Christ themes we could see within those movies so that we can kind of take a fresh look at the Christmas story through these classic films. So Pastor Dick looked at Scrooge and the choice between light and dark that's always before us. Uh, we then looked at Home Alone and the the theme of the misunderstood Messiah that we see in that old man Marley, the next door neighbor to Kevin. Last week, Pastor Aaron focused on a Christmas carol, and I was amazed at how well he pulled a couple of strong themes out of that. As he reminded us that we all seem to have that one thing. We think if we get it, it'll make us happy, and then we get it and discover reality is a different story. Today, we're focusing on It's a Wonderful Life, the film produced by by Frank Capra in 1946. Some interesting things about that movie. It uh, was rather a disappointment in the box office. It cost $3.6 million to produce the movie, but it only made $3.3 million in its first run. Matter of fact, uh, it had such serious competition that that year, of the next year of 1947, as it was officially released, it came in 26 of all the movies in box office receipts, one position ahead of another movie, Miracle on 34th Street. How about that? What's interesting is what made this movie get into the hearts and minds, I think not just the message of hope and love that it brings, but because in 1974 there was some snafu with its, with its copyright, and so for 20 years it was free to show the movie. So it was shown on every network over and over, and so it just got into our hearts and minds, and so it continues to live today. It has now become one of the American Film Institute's top 100 films. Its list that came out in 1998 had it 11th. It's also been considered one of the most inspirational films. The list that came out in 2006 by the AFI had it number one as the most inspirational film ever made. Pretty cool. Interesting thing is, I had never seen that movie until about three years ago. <laughs> and once I watched it, it has now become one of my favorite movies of all time. So, a few interesting facts about the movie itself. Uh, you might remember, uh, how many have seen it, just to make sure? Okay, Just about it, but there's a few of you, so. Um, a few interesting facts. You remember the scene where the uh, swimming pool is below the gym floor, and the gym floor wa opens up. You know, that, that's, that's still a functioning gym floor. Beverly Hills, Beverly Hills High School, it still functions. Uh, remember that scene where she used to throw a rock through the window of the abandoned house? And uh, so they had actually hired a sharpshooter to shoot it out because they assumed she would miss, but she actually hit it in the first try with perfect aim, didn't have to use the shooter. It's also considered by Donna Reed, by James Stewart. By the way, his first movie after World War II came back in that role. And also Frank Capra, it's their favorite movie of all time. Frank Capra always had a screening of that film with his family every Christmas. Now, for those of you that may not have seen it, let me give you a quick synopsis before we show a little bit of the video here. Um, so the plot is that George had these great dreams. He lived in Bedford Falls, New York, and it's a small town. He wants to go see the world. He wants to travel. He wants to get a university degree. He wants to be an architect that builds skyscrapers in cities all over the world. That's his dream. But then his dream gets short-circuited time and again. First, as his father dies, and if he doesn't stay, the building alone will have to close. Then he hopes his brother will take over. When his brother comes back from college, discovers he's ready to get married, and she's the new wife's plan to have him live somewhere else. And so he continues to stay. He marries, he has four children, lives a very modest life, just one step above. And then somehow his uncle has a little bit of a drinking problem, loses $8,000. And so he's about to be thrown in jail. He decides he's worth more dead than alive. He runs to the bridge outside of town to throw himself off. It's at that moment that his guardian angel, Clarence, drops down out of heaven falls into the river because he knows that George is the kind of person that will put aside his suicidal thoughts in order to save someone else. So the scene we're about to show is them now out of the river trying to get dry and clean, and George expresses that 
wished that he had never been born. Yeah, so you still think killing yourself would make everyone feel happier, eh? Oh, I don't know. I guess you're right. I suppose it'd been better if I'd never been born at all. What'd you say? I said I wish I'd never been born. Oh, you mustn't say things like that. You... Wait a minute. Wait a minute. That's an idea. What do you think? Yeah, I'll do it. All right. You've got your wish. You've never been bored. You don't have to make all that fuss about it. Of course, the genius of the movie, its plot, is now Clarence, his guardian angel, showing him what his life and the rest of those around him's life would be like if he'd never been born, as well as what would not have happened if he'd never been born. And so his first sign that something's happened is you notice it stops snowing, a little subtle thing. When he gets back to reality again, it will start snowing once again. And he goes into town and discovers the town has been renamed. It's now not Bedford Falls, but it's Pottersville because Henry Potter has now taken over everything in town. He walks into town and discovers it's dreary and there's drunkenness. There are people running around with police trying to deal with every problem. The movie theater is no longer open. The emporium, the department store is no longer open. And as he begins to discover everything that's wrong, he begins to get shook up because nobody recognizes him. He uh, notices that the bank and loan is no longer open. He goes to his mother's house, who now is having to run a boarding house because to make ends meet because George is not around to look after her. He goes to, to the home of a family friend, somebody they had helped, which was now called the Parker neighborhood that they helped so many people, the Bailey, I'm excuse me, the Bailey Park, that they helped so many people get homes on their own, and it no longer exists because his bank is not around to help people to get those loans. He discovers it's a wasteland, and there's a cemetery, and the cemetery's got the name of his brother, Harry Bailey, on it. And he says, this can't be. My brother went off to war, and he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved a whole transport of men. And Clarence has to remind him that Harry Bailey was not there to save all those men on that transport. They all lost their lives. Because remember, you, when you were nine years old, saved him out of the water where he would have drowned. And then Georgia asked to see his wife, Mary. And he finds her, he's informed that she had never married. She's the library. And when he confronts her, she's scared and introverted. Obviously, her life has been very small without George. And when she doesn't know him, she screams and runs into a nearby establishment. So George now, totally shook up, runs back to the bridge and pleads. He says, I want to live. I want to live. And it starts snowing again. And life is off, obviously different. What's well, an interesting thought, isn't it, to ask, what if George had never been born? And to ask that question again, what if Christ had never been born? This Christmas season, we stop and we ponder the meaning of God who came into this world as a child like one of us. What if that had never happened? Dan Guptill is a Wesleyan pastor from Nova Scotia, and he asked this question in a blog. Very interesting question. He points out Nietzsche basically posed this question in the late 1800s when he talked about God is dead, and that movement kind of took hold, and it still has many voices today. What if Christ had never been born? What would be different in our world? He points out at least three significant things. Number one, the poor would be looked at differently if Christ had never been born. He points out that Time again, Jesus embraced the poor. He received them. He was born into a rather poor family. And that has caused Christians forever to find the call to minister to those in need. How many of you have been to a store this year and seen somebody ringing a bell next to a kettle? 
Why is that the case? Because a Christian by Joseph McPhee in 1895, I want to say, he had this idea. He was wanting to put on a dinner for those in San Francisco in need. He didn't have any funds, and so he put a bucket out, remembering something he had seen in, in England. And so that started that tradition. Within six years, it already spread to the East Coast in Boston, and now it continues today. And who inspired Joseph McPhee? A man by the name of William Booth, you might have heard of, who founded the Salvation Army in England when he went and ministered in the streets to the poor. And who influenced William Booth? He happened to grow up in the Methodist movement. A man by the name of John Wesley had something to do with that. You know a thing or two about John Wesley? What a difference if someone has not been born that's passed on over and over. If Jesus had not been born because of the followers who follow him, the ill would be looked at differently. Jesus never stopped helping those who came to him in need. He touched the untouchables. The woman who came and touched his garment, he took time to talk to, and she experienced healing. And Christians who follow him have experienced that as well. As a matter of fact, in the second and third centuries, there was a plague that struck throughout the civilized world. And so many were dying from it, they literally were dragging bodies into the street. And it got so bad that those who even weren't even dead yet, but they saw who were dying, would drag them into the street to let them die on their own. Dionysius, the bishop of that time, says it was the Christians who didn't worry about their own safety, took the risk of, of taking, that, taking on that plague in order to minister to those who were still dying in those streets. And this quote's there about the kind of people that follow Christ. And that continues today. You know, the first hospitals were in monasteries. And you'll find even today, many of the hospitals that exist were started by churches, St. Francis, St. Vincent's, and many that carry the name of a denomination. The first hospitals were Christians. And one more thing. Women would be looked at differently if it wasn't for Christ being born. You know, in the Roman world, in the time of Christ, for every 100 women, there were 140 men. For every 100 women, there were 140 men. Why was that the case? Because it was understood that, that male children were more valuable than female children. Roman law said that male children all had to be raised by their fathers if they were healthy. But if it was a female, only the first daughter had to be raised. The rest would be brought out in the cold and left to die. But Christians took them into their homes. Because Jesus, you know it's interesting? The longest recorded conversation in the Bible was Jesus talking to a woman? John chapter 4, 42 verses long. All these things if Christ had never been born. But let's make this a little bit more personal. Have you ever felt like you wish you'd never been born? Have you ever had those moments? Or have you known of someone who's had those moments? I imagine most of us know somebody that's experienced depression to the point that you have a heck of a time talking them out of it. I don't think I've ever personally gotten to the point I've had suicidal thoughts, but believe me, I've had some depressed moments where I could have lots of empathy for those that did. I understood what it felt like to wish that you were dead. Fortunately, I had lots of resources around me and quickly found the help that I need to get through that. And how important it is for us to stop and ponder how critical that is for us to, to know the difference it would be if we'd never been born. And it's hard. If you ever talk to someone out of that, you find it's not very easy because sometimes it's brain chemistry. Sometimes there's just so many things going around that it's not a rational thing to talk someone out of their suicidal thoughts. And probably the worst things you can say is to them that, hey, suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem because that just minimizes their problems. What they need more than anything is to know that those problems can be shared, that they don't have to carry that burden all by themselves. So it's a good thing to ponder, what if I'd never been born? You know, with my, uh, I, I've had a lot more experience with suicide than I'd like. 
I've done three funerals of people who've committed suicide. Not a very fun task. I have an uncle, my mother's brother, who is also a schizophrenic, and he hung himself when I was a teenager. My mother attempted suicide three times in my life. Uh, well, actually, once before I was born and two times as I was growing up. And one of the interesting things was that I would try every tactic I could to talk her out when she was putting herself down and complaining, saying things like she had wished that she had never been born. Everybody would be better off if she wasn't. But there was one thing that would shut her down from those complaints. The one thing I could say that would get her just to stop. It would be temporary because that's what paranoid schizophrenics do. But she would stop for the moment. And what I would do is say, wait a minute, Mom. Didn't you give birth to Don and me and Carol? And we're all functioning pretty well in this world. And we're productive. Are you saying we shouldn't have been born? And that would stop. Kind of like Clarence's approach, isn't it? So it's a good thing for us to ponder. It's a good thing for us to do. And let me say, if you ever have the opportunity to share with someone something that you want to say about how they contribute to your life, then please do so because, who knows, it might be the thing that takes them away from their depression. I uh, got this text from my daughter last week. She happens to be a counselor in the Nashville school system, and so she deals with some tough situations. But this is what she just sent me out of the blue. I just want you to know how thankful I am that you raised us in a home with so much love and encouragement. I had a particularly tough situation today that broke my heart knowing she's going home to such an unhealthy place. Just know I love you. That's gold. So don't miss the opportunity to do something like that for someone else. How, how vital it is, how critical it is, how important it is. One, one more thought. Uh, there's a scripture that we certainly want to be reminded of. Psalm 139, 13 and 14. And if nothing else, just remember today that phrase that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Be sure to share that kind of thought with someone who's having suicidal thoughts. And be sure to embrace that yourself when life sometimes gets tough and you feel like there's more bad than good. And then one more thing to remember. The scripture today that we shared. If we go back to George's life, it seemed like he gave himself in so many ways and nothing was paying off, at least at that moment in his life. All I could think of was that $8,000 bill that he had to pay, and so he'd be better off dying and collecting the insurance that was $15,000 to pay it off. But in that scripture, we were reminded that all that did pay off. It all came back to George, didn't it? Jesus said more than once, the first will be last and the last first. And in this passage, he points out that we're called to be a servant, a slave. And that's how George lived his life. And it did all come back to him at that critical moment in his life. So keep that in mind. Let's watch that final scene from the movie. So many times. Mary did it, George. Mary did it. She told some people you were in trouble. And they scattered all over town collecting money. Didn't ask any questions. Just said, George, in trouble. And tell me, you spread like fair. Another run on the bank.
looks a little bit like heaven to me. We can look forward to that. So live your life as a servant. Know that all that good will someday come back. May we trust that God has created us. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, and therefore our life matters. Our life has an impact. Let's pray. Lord, if there is anyone here that's wrestling with their life at this point in time, may they hear your words. May they know that they have been created by you. May they find that opportunity to look around and see the lives they do touch, to see the contributions they do make. May they receive your love and acceptance as they are through Christ who is our Lord. Amen. Amen. 